and welcome to PPMD's gene therapy webinar series and introduction to gene therapy. So this is the first in a series of webinars we will be hosting about topics related to gene therapy. As the promise of gene therapy continues to move forward and there's an expansion of clinical trials, we at PPMD want to ensure that all families living with Duchenne and Beth Becker muscular dystrophy feel well informed about gene therapy. So today we're going to share some of the basics of gene therapy and then how that relates to the current microdystrophin gene therapy clinical trials in Duchenne. So as the field moves forward, we imagine that many different types of gene therapies will be offered. So it is our hope that some of the information being shared in this recording can serve as a primer over the coming years. So before we begin, we're going to have a quick recap of what a gene is and does. So a gene is a sequence of DNA that contains the code to make a protein. So when this gene is expressed or turned on, it produces a protein. Now, when a gene has a change, often called a mutation or a variant, the protein intended to be produced could be altered. Some of these mutations can change the function of a protein, while others can change the amount of the protein being produced, or it can completely inhibit the protein from being produced. So gene therapy is just a way to treat a disease by changing a gene expression. And this can be accomplished in a few different ways. The mutated gene can be modified in the cell. Uh, the different cells can have a replacement copy of that mutated gene provided. Or if there are other genes that might be able to help treat the disease, they may be used in place of providing a replacement copy. So when we think about Duchenne, which is caused by the DMD gene not making a functional dystrophin protein, we may want to correct the mutation in the DMD gene. There's some kind of gene editing. We might want to provide a new functional copy of the Duchenne gene, or we may want to deliver a different gene that can help treat the clinical presentation of the disease, so the, the symptoms of the disease. So when someone receives gene therapy, what are they actually being treated with? Well, there are three main components to gene therapy. Uh, the first two components are the genetic materials that are going to lead to new protein production. So that is the transgene, which is the replacement or the modifier or the surrogate gene that is going to be used and the promoter, which is going to control where that transgene is turned on. And the third component is the vector, and the, the vector is going to shuttle the other two pieces, that genetic material that's going to produce a new protein, the vector will shuttle that into the body. So to give some examples of what could be delivered, uh, this is going to be dependent on what the treatment is aiming to do. For instance, if the treatment is trying to modify a mutation, in the gene, then something like CRISPR-Cas9 might be used to edit the mutation in the gene. Um, a replacement copy of the gene could be provided. So a functional copy of the mutated gene uh, could be supplied to the cells. This is similar to what they're doing in the current microdystrophin trials, although the microdystrophin is not a full-length dystrophin gene. It is a uh, smaller version, but should have similar functionality. And then finally, a different gene can be delivered, um, either a surrogate gene for the one that is has a mutation, or possibly other genes that might be able to treat aspects of the disease. Um, so these are different types of things in terms of the genetic material that could be delivered. And for how that's delivered, um, this is performed by the vector. And again, there are many different types of vectors that 
could be used or are currently in development. So modified viruses, nanoparticles, cells, um, they can all be used to transport that important genetic material into the body. And these different vectors have advantages and disadvantages that will ultimately lead to their selection for a particular treatment. Now that you have a foundation for what gene therapy can be and the different components that go into making gene therapy work, we're going to talk about what is being used in these early uh, Duchenne gene therapy trials. So the genetic material being delivered in these early trials is attempting to provide the muscle cells with a microdystrophin protein. The genetic material being delivered consists of a promoter sequence and the microdystrophin transgene. The promoter is going to be the on-off switch that ensures that the microdystrophin transgene is active and producing protein in the muscle cells. The microdystrophin transgene will produce a shortened version of the dystrophin protein to help stabilize the muscle cell membrane. And so in these different clinical trials, they are all using slightly different versions of a microdystrophin transgene. They are all modeled after proteins seen in mild Becker muscular dystrophy patients. So the important parts of the gene are selected. Um, and in Becker muscular dystrophy, those patients have a truncated or shortened version of dystrophin that still supports uh, muscle membrane stability and overall muscle function into adulthood. And so that is what is being mimicked in these trials. Now, to shuttle this genetic material into the body, um, a vector needs to be used. And so they are using a viral vector known as adeno-associated virus, or AAV, in all of the trials. AAV is a naturally occurring virus. It is not known to cause disease in humans. Um, one of its positive aspects is it's extremely effective for delivering genetic material into muscle cells. Uh, on the other side of that, a downside is that it is on a smaller size so that only a small amount of DNA can actually be packaged into the virus for delivery, which is why all of these uh, trials involve using a microdystrophin gene rather than the full-length DMD gene. The next question then is, who can receive gene therapy? So in order to participate in the current gene therapy trials, a patient must be tested for pre-existing antibodies to the vector that is being used for delivery. So what are pre-existing antibodies and how are they relevant for gene therapy? Well, your immune system produces antibodies to protect you from pathogens, such as viruses. For example, once you have been exposed to a virus, your body can make antibodies that recognize that virus and prevent it from infecting your cells. So typically, this is thought of as a very beneficial process. Unfortunately, AAV, which is a, a virus, um, exists in nature. That means it is possible that a patient has been exposed to AAV at some point in their life and is producing antibodies that target the AAV uh, vector. This would mean that if gene therapy using AAV were given to a person with those antibodies, their body's immune system would react to the virus and those pre-existing antibodies would prevent the virus from delivering that beneficial genetic material to the cells. So if an individual has pre-existing antibodies to AAV, that is likely to prevent that person from receiving treatment at this time. So how can pre-existing antibodies be tested? Testing for pre-existing antibodies is performed by what's called a titer test, which uses a blood sample from a patient. So the test looks for pre-existing antibodies to the vector that is going to be used in a clinical trial, and 
it identifies the presence of antibodies and helps determine the amount of antibody uh, in an individual's blood. So there currently is no standardized protocol for screening uh, for pre-existing antibody titers, and each clinical trial sponsor has their own methodology that is specific to the viral vector that they are using. This is why receiving a blood test from a private laboratory will not grant you entrance into a clinical trial. It is important to note, however, that being excluded from one clinical trial for pre-existing antibodies does not automatically disqualify you from another. You would need to go through the screening process for each uh, clinical trial sponsor independently. Research is currently in progress to find ways to deliver gene therapy to those individuals who have pre-existing antibodies, though the timeline for when those solutions will be realized is unknown. For administration, the gene therapy is currently administered uh, using IV infusion in the hospital. The delivery process is relatively short and is typically followed by a monitoring period to observe the patient for any adverse reactions to the gene therapy. Now that we've covered some of these basics, we're going to go a bit more in-depth to the ongoing gene therapy trials in terms of the potential benefits, the risks, and the unknowns in these ongoing trials. One of the questions that tends to be important to those with Duchenne and their families are what are the potential benefits of participating in these current gene therapy trials that are delivering microdystrophin? So the first benefit is having microdystrophin protein production. So as previously mentioned, the microdystrophin transgene is not a full-length copy of the DMD gene. It is a shortened version. Um, it has been constructed to allow for a microdystrophin protein to be produced inside the muscle cells of the body and to help perform some of the function of a normal dystrophin protein. Again, these microdystrophin transgenes uh, were developed to be similar to the genes that are seen in uh, Becker muscular dystrophy patients. So the hope is that patients that receive this gene therapy will have milder symptoms similar to a person with Becker muscular dystrophy, and that these mild symptoms will uh, persist for the length of time that the microdystrophin protein is being produced. So the, uh, the other benefit of having this Becker-like microdystrophin protein is that it may help stabilize the muscle membrane, um, and that stabilization of the muscle membrane may slow down the rate at which muscle is replaced with uh, fatty tissue. Um, so this may lessen the downstream effects of the disease as well, such as something like inflammation. So overall, we're hoping to see a slower progression of the disease. So it is not a cure, but it could alter how the disease progresses. Um, and hopefully that slowing of progression lasts for as long as the microdystrophin protein is being produced inside the cell. Now, we also want to make sure that everyone who is eligible for gene therapy feels well informed um, about the potential risks and the uncertainties of gene therapy. So there may be negative side effects um, from receiving such a large dose of uh, viral vector. Uh, reports have included fever, nausea, fatigue, vomiting, decreased appetite, decline in platelet count, and elevation of liver enzymes. There have also been more serious cases involving acute kidney injury that have been reported. Um, and due to the small patient sample size in these clinical trials, it is difficult to identify factors that could put one individual at greater risk for receiving gene therapy. This is why it's very important that you consult with your medical care team before participating in any gene therapy trial. Another really important consideration is that currently, if you receive gene therapy, you will no longer be eligible for other trials. For many other non-gene therapy trials, as long as a participant has undergone a washout period, they can then enroll in a new trial. And a washout is just the amount of time needed after stopping an uh, investigational drug for that drug to be cleared out of the system and any of the potential benefits or side effects of the drug to have lapsed. And that's so that a new uh, trial isn't reporting the effects of a different drug. 
But because of the potential longevity and transformative nature of gene therapy, current trials exclude any patient who has received gene therapy. Also, even if this gene therapy is approved because of issues with pre-existing antibodies, um, that may prevent redosing. So once an individual is exposed to AAV, that vector that is delivering the transgene, the body will develop antibodies to that virus. Um, and this can be a barrier to receiving future gene therapy treatment. So there, again, is no approved protocol for redosing or how we are going to get around pre-existing antibodies. And there is no timeline for when or if there will be an acceptable protocol. So that is a, a risk to consider when thinking about participating in gene therapy trials. There are also some unknowns with gene therapy that we hope will be addressed in the near future, um, and we will continue to support research to answer those questions. Um, one of those questions is how long will this gene therapy treatment last? So again, it is currently a one-time treatment. The muscle cells that receive micro the microdystrophin transgene can begin to produce the microdystrophin protein that may help protect the muscle and change progression of the disease, but we don't know how long those benefits will last for an individual with Duchenne. We, again, do not know if or when redosing strategies will be developed and shown to be safe, meaning that this might be a one-time treatment, although we are hopeful that viable redosing strategies will be developed in the lifetime of these first generation of young boys receiving experimental treatment, but no one can say for certain if redosing will be safely and effectively achieved. So it is our hope that this presentation helped provide some clarity for what gene therapy is, as well as providing some insights for the decision-making process to participate in clinical trials. Following this presentation, we will be hosting a series of other gene therapy-related topics uh, presented by researchers and clinicians in the field. We intend to keep this page as a hub containing these webinars, a glossary of terms for your quick and easy reference, as well as hosting other materials that have been produced and are freely available online to bolster your understanding of gene therapy.